Hello, very beautiful community. We're going to have a conversation about that gesture that's gone around the world. Trump, after being struck on the ear, arose, lifted his arm up in the air and said, fight, fight. And the photograph of that um, has been viewed by tens and perhaps hundreds of millions of people. I don't want to discuss the obvious, which is the question of whether this optically and electorally helps Trump. It does. I want to instead make a psychological observation about what Trump was actually trying to do when he did that, a political observation about what kind of political act it was, and it's, it falls into quite an interesting and underestimatedly important category of political acts. And the third thing I want to do is say something psychoanalytical about it. By that, I just mean something more deeply psychological than Trump's, Trump's conscious intent, which I'll cover in that first psychological point. Now, this will be 20% less accessible than our usual chats, and this is just a permanent predicament for a minor public intellectual who tries to be responsible. It's absolutely wrong to always speak in, like a two-year-old and be below what everybody is capable of understanding, but it's also wrong to spend large amounts of time talking in an inaccessible way. So you want to welcome people onto a boat for a little ride around the lake and it's fine if they need to do a little walk um, if they need to cross a little jetty to get to the boat and they need to maybe put on an extra jumper to be on it that's fine but you also don't want to shout from one mile out from the shore at you know uh, people saying come along on the boat right they're not going to hear you right and that's the public intellectual equivalent of self-indulgence really it's not helping anybody but today we'll be just a drop more into potential incomprehensibility um, but that's okay is it okay i'm going to say it's going to be we're going to be mostly okay so let's see i think the the, the first psychological point is going to be completely ex accessible to everybody no matter how badly i explain it and that is the debate between the position that says look trump rose up in the air like that to impress the audience and show them that he was upright and vigorous and then against that there is the argument that says no it was a much more calculating much more talented even though trump is as i label him a destructive post-truth populist and much more sophisticated political act based on animal instincts about how that moment might interact with wider political currents that Trump might be able to inflect via responding to it in a particular way. So no, I don't just think it's Trump raising up to show to the audience um, that he is uh, vigorous and courageous. It was a much more calculating political act. I don't want to go as far as saying that Trump visualized the photograph going around the world, but I absolutely want to say that this happened and suddenly Trump's animal instincts said, no, I am doing this. I'm elevating my arm up in the air. And absolutely, the wider political landscape, the election, is what he is trying to manipulate. So you might say, well, hang on, isn't this a bit more systematic than is uh typical of trump yes but while trump is indeed barely capable of systematic thought and doesn't have many beliefs he has dispositional states that come and go and blow in the wind he does do something systematically and one of the things he's been doing systematically all his life is dealing in appearances and how his appearances impact people and what consequences for him that will have. He is not just systematic, but also obsessive and even pathological about that. I don't want to use bureaucratic categories like narcissistic personality disorder, but certainly we're dealing with a narcissistic disorder there. So I've taken the clear side here, and I believe it's an easy win. It's a, it's a knockout blow. This was an animal instincts driven, um, insightful, political act it wasn't just ah, I'm gonna get up show them I'm fine the second point I jotted down to discuss with you is political and it, it, it's an important political point because it, it's a, a point about that space where political leaders take advantage of events they can't control 
where the character of a politician and contingency come together and in virtue of their character they manage to manipulate contingency in their favor. The most resplendently, and you might um, also say disturbingly, articulate person about this political um, experience in the history of the West is Machiavelli, who has a whole chapter on it in, in The Prince, small chapter. And what Machiavelli insisted on is that we broaden that space in the middle, that space between foreseeable events that political leaders can control and unforeseeable events which they can't control. And he said, look, a lot of the greatest politics happens in that space where contingent, unforeseeable events are controlled by political leaders because they are in virtue of character prepared for them. Now, if you go to Machiavelli, you'll be a little bit shocked that you might not recognize the language I'm using. That's because this is my language for our conversation. I'm not talking about virtu, occasione, fortuna. These are Machiavelli's words, and they would need a little bit more painting if we put them on the table, so I don't want to do that. But Machiavelli is an extraordinary um, source for this. And I genuinely think this is an extraordinary um, and underestimated political space whereby um, politicians' character gets expressed under particular circumstances. Other examples that you may well be deeply familiar with of this may be Zelensky choosing to stay. And I'm actually thinking of a main channel video on why Zelensky stayed at some point. I don't know if that would be. Tell me if that would be interesting for you. Another possible um, example of this in the negative, in, in a politically unlovely uh, uh, um, side, is possibly Putin's um, decision to annex Crimea in 2014. So we, we underestimate how much change in the world occurs as, re as a result of the interaction of uh, character and contingency in politics. Mm. Are you ready for me to lose you? This is where we come to the um, third point I've jotted down, which is psychoanalytic. Forget about that word. For for the purpose of this conversation. That's just how I've labeled it. Trump's act, while being courageous, was theatrical, infantilized, and even a bit sexualized. Yeah, that act of raising up his arm and saying, fight, fight. So how is this possible? What are we talking about here? I'm going to put on the table an extremely destructive word, a word that is in the way it has been used in practice has done unbelievable amount of damage to decent people struggling in their lives in the 20th century. And that word is hysteria, a word with a very, very dark history. But that dark history doesn't completely emaciate it of having some useful explanatory value. And the trouble is that that term has been in the most disgraceful way used by medicine, when the medicine has no right to touch that term. And I would even argue psychiatry has no right to touch that term. But the problem with this term is that in the 20th century, um, people, and women more than men, so this is a feminist issue, have been labeled by the, as, as, as hysterical by medical professionals, by neurologists, also by psychiatrists, when all that was wrong with them was that they were physically ill. This happened to multiple sclerosis patients early on, and it's happening right now to patients with um, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, for example. Now, I want to say that this is indeed a dark history, and a dark history that unfortunately doesn't even make the psychoanalytic profession themselves come out in a good light, because some of the most articulate explanations of what might be useful about that term by psycho psychoanalysts are themselves full of this absolutely disgraceful riding roughshod over categories of human experience, like physical illness, that um, 
uh, should absolutely not come under the umbrella of this term. Um, that's highly embarrassing for psychoanalysts, of course, because they pride themselves in doing what the best of them do beautifully, which is dance with you when you've done a number in your pants and not stopping dancing with you, even if you've done a number in your pants and even if you don't have any idea that you've done a number in your pants. But in um, not understanding that you can't call people with physical illnesses hysterical, um, unfortunately, many psychoanalysts have done a very big number in their own pants. And that is utterly humiliating because that should be the profession that is last to do a number in its pants and not notice it enough. So I, I needed to, to rant on like this because I understand how damaging, how much appalling damage that term has done and how it has zero place in medicine. And its uh, descendants like conversion disorder have zero place in my view in, in biological medicine. So a neurologist shouldn't diagnose you with anything like this. But um, do I think that there's something interesting about that concept that we, we, we can get from Freud and it, its descendant expressions? Yes. So let's go. And I'm going to put this very simply. There are people who relate to different parts of their body, like their arms, their hands, or their nose, or their lips, as though that were their genitalia, as though that were an extension of their genitalia. That's the beginning of a conversation about that mechanism. And immediately it may become clear that you actually can't explain Trump's pout without using the notion of hysteria. In your life, you may also have some people who are not just narcissists, but vulnerable narcissists. Trump isn't a vulnerable narcissist. But vulnerable narcissists very often experience parts of their body as though they were an extension of their genitalia. You may hug a person like that, could be your neighbor, could be your, your you know, mother-in-law, could be um, a friend. And you think, oh, this feels a little bit sexualized, that hug, or a little bit sexually ambiguous. That is because you're not relating to your arms as your genitalia, and they a little bit are. So, what that act was for Trump, fundamentally, is a bit like little Jason, who is four years old, recognizing that his parents are having guests over and it's bedtime for Jason and Jason is for decides to throw off his clothes and just run into the living room and say hello everybody this is me and the parents say well I, this is little Jason he's taken an unusual fashion decision here tonight now Jason why don't you go to your room and put on some shorts so that's going to be really cool to do that I think um is this a courageous act for Jason? Yeah, it possibly is, but he nevertheless wanted to meet the neighbors naked. So that's the best image analog for what Trump was doing. I'm going to call it infantilized. I've written three words here. Infantilized, theatrical, and sexualized. I'm going to call it theatrical because it's a form of masking that is an imitation of other conditions other human experiences, and it is sexualized. Just like the this uh, character's pouting is unfortunately sexualized. So that is the, the, deep, the deeper explanation. Um, so yes, you can say that it was a courageous act, and yes, you can say that it was a very politically gifted act, and the psychology is very much, oh, yes, big picture, animal instincts kicking in, election, 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 advantage, 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 optics, optics. It was that impressive, yes. But fundamentally, it is an expression of Trump's narcissistic personality challenge of which with a pair of pliers, I wanted to say one element is this hysterical dynamic. Thank you so much for being with me.